All right, we're getting into the last few videos in this course, and to move on to the difficult Arduino project, we need to investigate communication protocols. In the intermediate project, we saw that we can send these triggers or pulse functions to trigger events that can be read, but that gives us a limited range of what we can do. So we need to investigate the standardized communication protocols. And like I said, this allows us to send a wide range of data rather than just having this high-low transition. And to avoid infinite communication schemes, we standardize the way that things are done. But to get into how communication schemes can work, we need to look at the different ways that we can communicate between devices. So we have two options we can look at, and that's going to be serial communication and parallel communication. So if we consider serial communication first, what we're going to do is we're going to send data bit by bit, so that's going to happen sequentially, or you can kind of think of that in series. And that data is going to be sent over a single channel. While the opposing way for communication, if we consider the parallel option, that is going to send data over several channels all at once. So the parallel communication way will use more channels. And what we recover from that is that we can send data at a much faster rate. So something you may need to consider is the speed versus cost. And I think it's very intuitive. If you need more channels, you probably will have a more expensive system. And another thing we need to consider if we use this parallel option for communication is the transmission length. So if we look back above, notice we are sending data over several channels at once. So we need to minimize the propagation delay that we may have in that data line. And as we get to extreme lengths, those propagation delays add up. So the way that this would work is you could have something like a microcontroller that's going to generate the data that is going to send over each individual channel. And then that data is pushed over all of those channels. Now on the receiving end, you'll have another microcontroller or something of similar nature. It's going to get that data, decode it, and then act accordingly as it needs to. But as we've come to learn, there's a lot of complexity in this especially if we are prioritizing reliable communication, which is always a priority. So given the content of this course, we're going to consider serial communication for now. So if we start to look at our serial communication protocols, there's three that we want to focus on. We have UART, we have I2C or I2C you might also hear, and then you have SPI or SPI. So if we start with UART, it's going to stand for Universal Asynchronous Reception and Transmission. So we can break down what this means. So asynchronous, that's going to mean that you have no clock signal dependence. The reception and transmission. So really what that says is that we can get and send data. And there's a few ways that we can do that. We can have the simplex. So this is going to be data transmitted in one direction. We can have half duplex. So data can transmit in both directions, but not at the same time. And then lastly, we can have full duplex. So again, data transmits in both directions and it can happen at the same time. Now the general procedure that happens is given here. So we could have something like a microcontroller, call it microcontroller one, and that's going to load data onto a data bus. So that's given down here by microcontroller one. So then you also have this UART one right here. So that's going to convert the data that's on the bus into a serial stream. And then it's going to push it through this TX1 or transmitter 1. So you can see TX1 is connected to RX2, which is going to be receiver 2 on that second UART. So UART2 gets that data from the serial stream, puts it back to the data bus. And then we have a second microcontroller here, which would hold that data from the bus. But if we consider the half duplex and full duplex things we talked about up here, we could also have a similar thing where UART2 transmits to UART1. So then you would have an arrow that looks like this. So this is how the communication between the two UARTs would look. And because we have no clock signal for the synchronization of the messages, we need to configure the speed of communication on both of these UARTs. But if we actually start to think about what we're sending, we have to look at the defined message structure. So we're going to have a message or what we can call a packet. And that packet of data is going to include some start and stop bits. Of course, our data bits. We have something called a parity or a parity bit, and this is what's going to make up our message. And this is our structure that we follow. Now, if we look into this a little bit more, we can look at what all of these bits do. We can start with our start bit, and it is convention to have the transmitting pin high 
when we're not sending data. So to signify that we are going to send some data, we simply have that start bit low. So that's going to be a zero. Our data frame is whatever we want to send. So that can be whatever binary info we want. The parity bit is there for determining errors. And the way that this is done is by counting the number of bits in the data. And it's going to be counting the values that are a one in that data. So if we have an even number of ones, our parity bit is a zero. If we have an odd number, it's a one. And then lastly, the stop bit. So with the start bit, we pulled TX low or zero right here. So to signify that the message is done, we simply pull it high. And that's what encompasses our entire packet or message. We can look at an example and let's consider sending the value 77 in decimal from UR1 to UR2. So we would be using TX1 going to RX2. So we can't just send 77 in the data frame. We need to know the binary representation of that. So we know our start bit is going to be a zero. We have our data frame with 77 converted into binary. We have our parity bit, which we don't know what it is yet. Then we have our stop bits. And in this case, we're only using one stop bit. So we just call that a one. And if we look at the parity bit, you can see that we have four one values in the data frame. So this would represent an even amount of ones. And if we look back up here, if we have an even amount of ones, that parity bit goes to zero. Now, when we're actually sending this message to UR2 from UR1, our message sends, of course, from that start bit. So this packet pretty much gets reversed. But this is actually where we run into a problem because we need to look at the data frame and consider how we are sending that data. And then really how the UR2, the receiving side, is actually going to take that data and build up with it. And this is where we get a little bit tricky with things because we need to introduce how this data frame is actually structured. So it's going to be structured by the least significant bit on the left, and that's going to go to the most significant bit on the right. And we've talked a little bit about least and most significant bits. But if we have these definitions, well, we know that this actually doesn't match what we entered into the data frame because in the number 77, when we convert that to binary, what is on the left is your most significant bit, and what is on the right is your least significant bit. So if we actually want to structure this into the data frame, we need to flip what we currently have. And this is actually the correction we would have to make from our original assumption for how the data frame is structured. But without really introducing this time concept of how the message is sent, we couldn't really start with this. It might be too confusing. But that brings us pretty much to where we need to be for UART. So we can look into the I2C which stands for inter-integrated circuit. And this works pretty much on a different principle completely. So we have bi-directional communication, but this time it is synchronous. So we know that there is a clock that's going to be heavily involved. We have two lines. We're going to have the SCL line, which stands for serial clock line, and an SDL line, which is serial data line. Now, another thing that I2C does is it introduces us to this master-slave terminology which is a little bit weird of terminology, but I guess that is what it is. So we will have a master device, and this is going to generate the clock signal and the transfer of data. And we can have multiple slave devices. Each of those slave devices is going to need a unique address. And since all of the slave devices have unique addresses, it actually allows us to put all of these devices on one bus. So if we get into the operation, we have a master that would pull SDA from high to low, and then SCL. Then the master will send the address of the slave device that it's trying to communicate with, and additionally a read or write bit, which pretty much says that the master is going to tell the slave to do something, or it's going to request some data from the slave. So because everything is connected on the same bus, all of these slave devices get the address that the master sends out, but only the slave device with the matching address is going to send an acknowledgement bit back. So then once we have this established communication, we can either send data from the master to the slave or vice versa. And then similar to UART, we have some termination condition to end a message. So if we look at the setup of that, this is what we're looking at here, where we have a master device, we have slave number one and slave number two. We have our SDA and SCL lines. And notice here, everything is connected on the same bus. So if the master sends out the address for slave one, Slave 1 will send some data back on this bus to the master. Slave 2 will do nothing. 
So it's really the addressing of the slaves that make this possible. Now, in addition to this, there's no reason why we can't actually have multiple masters. So you could tie another master out here. But if we compare this to the UART topology, UART can't really do this functionality naturally. Really want to emphasize naturally. There are ways to kind of do this. And this will bring us into our last communication protocol, which will be the spy protocol or serial peripheral interface. So we have more than two lines, and those consist of MOSI, which is master output slave input. We have MISO, so master input slave output. We have SCLK, so that's going to be a clock that's generated by the master. And then we have this CS, which is going to be chip select. And if we look at the topology for this, right here we have a master, and then these smaller devices are slave 1, slave 2, and slave 3. So we have our clock, MOSI, and MISO signals that again go to each device. But now we have these chip selects, and that's also going to help us select which chip we want to use. Pretty good naming convention right there. And we're not going to dive fully into this one. It would be better to really learn everything about I2C and then jump into SPY. But for what we need to understand for this course, it's really that there are standardized communication protocols that we can use to send data. And maybe you're asking which one is best. And there really isn't an answer for that, unfortunately. Again, with many things in engineering, it depends on the application. So there's a lot of factors to come into play. And UART is actually what we're going to use on our last Arduino project. So again, if we go into the data sheets for the Arduinos, you can see here for the Nano Every, we have an RX and TX. And if we look at the 2560, you can see that we have multiple RX and TX lines. You can also see here that we have the SDA and SCL lines. So if we wanted to implement another communication protocol, we could. So in the next video, we're going to introduce that more difficult project with everything we've really learned. But if you learned anything new or useful in this video, please like, comment, share, subscribe. Helps the YouTube algorithm, and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.